Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is a, uh, another detailed uh, July garden tour. I thoroughly covered a uh, space that's kind of behind and uh, to the uh, left of the camera uh, three or four days ago. And I'm going to break this, the rest of the front yard down into two videos as well. That one ended up being like 25 minutes. And so, um, you know, just keeping them a reasonable length and then going through all the detail that's in these beds, I figure I'll break this one down as well. Uh, keep in mind, this is an ongoing project. There's um, a front porch going across this house eventually. And so there's some azaleas on the right, some old mature azaleas. It's actually a mix of different, uh, a mix of different varieties over there. I've pruned them back hard once. They actually bloomed great this spring. Eventually, there's a little green retaining wall, cinder block retaining wall down there that is coming out and a uh, porch is being built up to the height of the existing front stoop and a porch, a, a full porch is going across the front of this place. So those azaleas, although they are the backdrop to what's going on here now, will eventually not be here. Um, uh, but they look good now. I mean, I've, 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 like I say, I've pruned them, fertilized them, mulched that bed, and uh, they bloomed well this spring. Uh, this spot on the corner here is gonna continue to be a small annual bed, and small meaning probably like three packs of annuals will be able to fill this space up. Uh, I used uh, pine bark and compost mix in that space uh, and mixed it in really, really well to start with. Had pansies and, um, and some snapdragons here uh, over the winter time. And now uh, this summer it's uh, zinnias. Uh, there's some coleus, uh, yellow coleus on the left. And I talked about in that last video, those yellow coleus need like a month or so to get used to the full sun and then they'll be fine. There's some vinca uh, on the corner here and a uh, annual salvia that was just cut back. And uh, so it'll pop back up about this tall. The ones in the other bed over there look, look great. There was a variegated dutzia that, uh, that just got transplanted uh, to this space. It's a, uh, a dutzia that just happens to have a uh, beautiful variegated foliage. It's got a little bit of transplant shock on it. It lost a few leaves uh, in the process, but it should look great here. It'll end up about you know, a couple feet tall. Um, it's not a, those variegated plants like that aren't going to be super fast, super fast growing. There's a sweet viburnum uh, planted right here, which will ultimately be a foundation plant once that uh, front porch goes in. Uh, that sweet viburnum, uh, which uh, gets fragrant flowers on it. I'm in an area uh, that is vulnerable to these being hurt pretty badly, probably, um, and so. I'm hoping having it closer up here to the house will, will help with that, but I can keep this plant, you know, anywhere between four and six feet in height, uh, and prune it um, after it flowers uh, every early summer. But uh, uh, it bloomed, uh, had a, it, had some, it had some flowers on it this first spring, but not a whole lot. Uh, in the future, it will have tons. There's a salvia here called mulberry jam for whatever reason, it's decided to be super vertical. It's getting plenty of sun here. Normally, when you see something stretch and grow this vertical, it'd be a lack of light. It's not a lack of light. This one just seems to have a really vertical habit on it. I walked out this morning and there was a hummingbird on this little single flower uh, uh, right there. It needs to be cut though. I think it needs to be cut in half to fill out a little more, but this is a uh, kind of a pinkish uh, salvia. There is a sunflower uh, next to that. It was a volunteer, a uh, full, I mean, this, this was a, just a beautiful sunflower. It's actually at the beach while it was in full bloom and the person that was helping water here was sending me photos of it. A uh, seed is set in here now. And so uh, uh, I would imagine squirrels and others will start doing their thing uh, to these seeds at this point. You can see now where the uh, flower parts, you know, you can take the flower parts off and see all the seed that's under there. This thing weighs a ton actually uh, with all the seed that's actually in there. But this was a volunteer and I just let it, I just let it go. But look at all those Look at all the sunflower seed that's in there. Uh, kind of amazing. I just made a, made a giant mess. Uh, like I said in the first video, there's a lot of annuals here planted on these bed edges uh, because I'm waiting for the perennials to get a little bit bigger. And so uh, planted around this bed edge, there's some gomfrina, uh, there's some uh, celosia, there are pentas. Uh, all of these things are great for pollinators. Uh, the gomfrina really gets worked all day long. Uh, every one of these little individual flowers in these clusters, you can see a bee just spend tons of time on them. Uh, there's some uh, pink pentas here. And as we go around, you'll just see these things uh, kind of repeated. Uh, gomfrina, celosia, pentas, uh, and so on and so forth. And that's along this bed edge this year while other perennials get larger. There are, uh, uh, 
three agapanthus in this space. Uh, this one's called Queen Mum. It may be the most beautiful flower, uh, uh, <laughs> one of the most beautiful flowers I've ever seen. It is, uh, has this incredibly, Queen Mum has this super sturdy stem and the flower cluster is just super compact. And they're literally just gonna be a couple hundred flowers here by the time all of these open. Again, the hummingbirds, the bees, everything working those flowers all day. I've got a bee working this little purple one uh, right here. They bury themselves all the way into those flowers, which is kind of interesting. There's a couple other salvia here. I'm a big giant salvia fan, you guys can tell. Um, uh, there's one called amethyst lips and one other variety I'll put up on the screen. I can't remember the uh, name of it right now they've been planted in this space they'll come back every year and again they're going to be bigger next year so there'll be less um you know fillers uh, in this space one thing i really love and you guys anybody who's watched me for a while now knows this uh this is african basil uh back here uh, elsa uh flopped it apart a little bit but already it's filling back in this thing gets any light at all and it immediately will fill fill back in this african basil there's nothing that grows faster, blooms heavier, uh, and uh, attracts more pollinators uh, to your garden. Uh, it's a perennial basil, actually, which is unusual in the, uh, uh, for a basil. Most, most basils are annuals. This one's a perennial, but it's only hardy in like zone uh, nine and 10 or something like that. So I can take cuttings on it and then keep them protected through the winter to keep them going, or they become pretty readily available. Uh, and uh, they grow so fast. These three plants were six inches tall, and now they're, they're three by three. And again, Elsa uh, laid them open, uh, Tropical Storm Elsa laid them open, and they've already started to fill back in. Just nothing grows faster. But peak afternoon, these are just completely covered uh, in bees, uh, which, is, which is kind of fun to watch. A couple containers in the back. Uh, there's an upright holly uh, in this container that's underplanted with some celosia. And then there's a, a holly that I tree formed in the rectangular container. And then I did this container in a, a video. These are uh, zinnias and uh, they're actually underplanted with these uh, ornamental peppers. These ornamental peppers as the summer goes on should come up and make more of a show. In front of that container, there's a, uh, a lantana called bandana yellow. And that little gap right there, I'm assuming that once this thing really gets going, lantana can be Midsummer for me before it, I mean, it blooms by June every year, but it doesn't really kind of take over the world until July and August. And I think that it will fill that entire uh, empty space that's there uh, during, the, uh, during the summertime. If I can kind of back out of here, about it here. Uh, this Indian hawthorn that's planted here is uh, pretty exciting. Uh, it'll eventually come up about this high. So um, right now I know it looks buried in these vast growing annuals and perennials, but it'll eventually show itself in this space. This is a, an upcoming release from the Southern Living Plant Collection. This one's called uh, Cl uh, Clean Sweep Snowbank. It was selected for being disease resistant. And if you guys, disease resistant or leaf spot resistant. If you guys have seen, there are a lot of Indian hawthorn varieties that just get terrible leaf spot issues thin during the summertime. This one is completely clean. I haven't seen a spot on it. I've had it in this, in this space for six or seven months and everybody, I've, the nurserymen that are starting to grow this plant, everywhere I've seen it, it's the nicest Indian hawthorn I've seen uh, in, in a long, long time. And so I think this is gonna be a great introduction. This is a white flowering one. Again, it'll reach three or four feet tall, and three or four feet wide. Perfect little domes, never really needs any attention. Uh, in the container on the front of the bed, there's a Daphne planted. Uh, I planted four Daphne uh, in a video earlier this year. This one went into a container. This is a beautiful variegated, uh, a variegated variety that I got my, from my buddy, uh, Jason Stevens. Um, he uh, frequently goes to uh, plant sales, and I'm trying to remember the name of his company, Superior Plants. Uh, and uh, he grows a lot of super, super interesting plants. Uh, this plant, this Daphne like well-drained soil. And so um, uh, I made sure that the uh, drainage was, uh, I, I, I put some of that expanded slate product into the uh, planting mix to make sure this container would never stay wet. And it's underplanted with this light pink celosia, which looks great with this variegated foliage. Really, uh, that combo looks great. Uh, again, the gomfrina continues around the edge. Here's a, a new gold lantana that will eventually fill up this whole space this summer. 
This was in a how to transplant lantana video. I think back in the fall, I think it was back in the fall when that video went up, but it's come back to life here and it'll fill a lot of this space. This, uh, uh, the land that's available here, it will take it pretty quickly. There's a uh, variegated uh, Lonicera, uh, Lonicera nidia. Uh, I, planted, I planted this in one of the weekly update videos. Uh, the Southern Living Plant Collection actually has three of these new varieties of Lonicera nidia coming. These are great ornamental plants. They were um, a tour, beautiful tour video I did in a neighbor's house earlier in the spring. There was one that was about two and a half feet tall, maybe three feet wide uh, in their garden. And that's kind of what I've envisioned for this one. Unfortunately, this is a plant that a lot of growers aren't growing. And so I had to buy one from a specialty nursery. It was in a four inch pot. So it's kind of, it kind of looks like nothing here, but eventually it'll be two and a half, three feet tall and uh, you know about equally as wide and it won't take long. It's already put on three or four inches of growth since it was planted there. This is just going to be a year round variegated uh, you know, evergreen piece. So Holly's taking up prime position uh, in the filming this morning like she always does. I think I have, I don't know, there's over a thousand videos on this channel. I would be kind of crazy to go back and count how many times she uh, photobombed one of them. Uh, this uh, Indian hawthorn is tree, uh, this is a tree formed Indian hawthorn. Uh, this variety is called Rosalinda. It has big giant leaves and big giant flower clusters that are super, super fragrant. Uh, I got this piece from a nursery down in South Alabama and they were tree farming lots of them. This is an Indian hawthorn that's not quite as cold hardy as that uh, clean sweep uh, snowbank that I just showed a minute ago. This one's definitely a zone eight hardy plant. I'm in 7B, but I'm in the city. There's asphalt over here next to me. The house is here. I think it will be uh, fine in this space. If it was gonna get abnormally cold, I might throw a sheet uh, over it because I definitely don't want to, uh, to lose it. But that is a tree formed uh, Indian hawthorn. Uh, to the right of that, this is a, a salvia called Wendy's Wish. And man, I love this entire series of salvia. All the ones that are something in Wish. I think these were done in Australia and the uh, some of the money goes to the Make-A-Wish Foundation in Australia. I don't know if they still do, but uh, at one point they did. This one's called Wendy's Wish. The calyx is on all of these. The calyx, the part that holds the flower uh, to the stem there, is just as beautiful as the flower. So after the flower falls out, it still looks like it has flower sitting above it. Very vigorous growing variety. Sometimes comes back for me and sometimes doesn't, but I can find these in a little quart pot for four bucks in the spring from big bloomers down in Sanford. And, um, there you go again uh, next year if, it do, if I don't see it coming back. There's uh, white uh, petunias used at the entryway for those two stones that were placed on the edge of the uh, zoysia turf. This stone path that comes in here has actually not been laid yet. I've got some drip irrigation in here and I need to get these stones kind of lined up with the irrigation under the mulch and so that it passes through between the stones going to take a little bit of uh, work. Not that big of a deal, but um, I have not set those stones uh, in place yet. Uh, back behind uh, the uh, tree form Indian Hawthorn is an Autumn Majesty on Corazelia. Autumn Majesty was new for this year. It's a double purple uh, variety. Blooms like mad. I mean, that thing was full on uh, purple for a couple of weeks. It has put on a lot of new growth and is budded up again there's, yeah, there's some buds forming on the tops of these uh, right now. And so I expect I'll get some uh, more flowers here by September or October on it. It will find whatever pattern. I find with these Encore Azaleas, they'll find a pattern that works for the space they're in. Sometimes they'll bloom spring, summer, and fall. Sometimes they'll bloom spring and then late summer and then try to put on a couple more in the fall. Sometimes they just go the best flowering they're going to do is in the fall. And partial bloom in the spring, that kind of thing. Uh, kind of interesting that, uh, but they'll find, it'll find its pattern and uh, I'll be happy with that. But this is, like I say, a double purple variety. It contrasts beautifully with this gold Mexican sage. This is the gold variety. Again, it's another one of those zone eight, um, maybe even zone nine uh, perennials. Uh, maybe the gold one's probably, maybe even zone nine. Uh, it may or may not come back, but again, uh, Look at look how beautiful it is for this uh, season. It should end up pretty tall. This was again. This was a a little little tiny pot, and it's done that uh, really 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 quickly. Uh, I'll come back this way before I uh, do the uh, Lakotha weed that's on the path. Here's a peach tree, and for those of you who uh, 
watched any last year as I started this project in the front yard. Right here, this peach tree was planted in the ground and it had been planted too deep. The, um, the graft was below the uh, soil. And uh, so I, I just dug it up, put it in this plastic pot. This is super temporary. I'm just trying to get it to come back, but it has recovered quite a bit. Last year it had like, it had like this many leaves total last year. So, you know, I've quadrupled the number of leaves on it. So I think it is gonna be fine. I've gotta find a sunny spot, um, maybe in the backyard uh, to put it back in the ground, but I'm gonna leave this graft above the, uh, above the ground. But that explains why that thing is sitting there in a, in a, in a plastic pot. Uh, behind, uh, back in the very back is another tree form. This is a Cestrum parkey. A friend of mine uh, did this cutting for me. It has bloomed since it went in the ground. This video is uh, maybe six weeks ago, five weeks ago, when this video went up. It's continued to bloom. Uh, it blooms pretty continually during the summer. Uh, great plant uh fragrant flowers in the evening which is kind of weird you'll see the flowers all day but they're they're more fragrant during the uh the evening pollinators on it great looking plant just a great looking plant and again i'm going to kind of, i'm going to take all this off here i'm going to straighten this top up and uh, have it as a tree form uh, in the background uh, in this space so eventually this path this path is going to be stone and lead you all the way around to the back the stone's actually sitting here uh, and uh, I'm going to I need to maintain places where I can, you know, bring a bring a wheelbarrow all the way around the house. I say this in any kind of landscape design uh, that I'm doing, any consultations that I'm doing, is to you want to maintain ways to get, you know, all the way around the space so it can all be maintained easier. Traffic flow is better. If you want to have a party in your backyard, you don't want everybody to come through the house. You know, I've, I've got ways to navigate this garden. Uh, those things are thought through before any of the plant decisions or anything else uh, goes in. The uh, man, the bees are the bees are starting to uh, to come out. I shoot these videos super early in the morning, and you guys don't see what really happens out here, which is by midday. Uh, it's just a swarm. Uh, here's a, here's a bee here. Look on this salvia. This is kind of super interesting. The way this bee has to work this salvia, he doesn't have the tool to go into this a long flower. This flower is designed for a hummingbird or a moth or something like that. So he goes in here and cheats. He actually um, sticks a protrusion into the end of that flower and steals that nectar. Um, got a little bit of a cheat he uses to, uh, you know, nature designed that flower for a different pollinator, but it, that bee has decided it knows exactly, it knows exactly what to do <laughs> to get that nectar anyway. Uh, Behind, the, uh, behind that salvia is a, a shrub I really love. This is uh, Burning Love Lakothawi. Uh, this plant, when it's growing, is just absolutely covered in purple new growth. Uh, Lakothawi can be a little bit finicky in my clay soil, so I did mound this up quite a bit. It's not, it's not sitting very deep in that. I haven't over mulched around it. After I mulch, I like to go back and pull the mulch around away from it a little bit. But a uh, great plant. Uh, I wish it was in peak growth right now because you, what you would be seeing is a purple uh, shrub. But this is, an, this is a great evergreen. Flowers, flowers are insignificant, mostly grown for this new purple foliage. Uh, behind it, um, this, is a, uh, uh, this is a Chinese uh, sarcococa or sweet box. Um, the Chinese variety stays pretty tame. Uh, this one will get you know, in that uh, two to three foot range and a little bit wider than tall blooms along the stems uh, in the winter time. Uh, lots of varieties of sweet box available to you. I, I like this one because of how tame it is. Uh, fragrant flowers for a very long time. And flowers when a lot of other things aren't flowering. These will flower in March, April, even, even in February if it, if it happens to warm up. But right along the stems uh, of the plant. And uh, behind it, um, I've got an Edgeworthia. Uh, Edgeworthia is another winter flowering shrub has kind of upside down lantern shaped uh, flowers on it that are yellow and white. There are, other, there are other colors available as well, but most of what you'll see is uh, white with a yellow center. You kind of got to get under the flower a little bit to see it. One of the most fragrant things you can have in your garden. This one has grown like mad. Anyone who saw me plant this thing in the video, it was only like this big. So this is a lot of growth in the first season. So I'm super, super happy with that. So this will be the last little section that I show you. A lot of the things that are in here are so new that they're, you know, they're, they're, they're quite small. I think ultimately this tour is going to end up being, 
it's maybe 40 feet wide and 15 feet deep or something like that. So what you will have seen this morning is about 600 square feet of, uh, of, of garden. Uh, in the, uh, the main piece uh, in this space is this Miss Kim lilac. This was already here. When I got here, it bloomed like mad this spring. The limbs were all the way down to the bottom though, and it took up so much square footage. This is a little two tenths of an acre lot in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I don't have a lot of garden space. And so uh, I went in a pruning video and, and limbed this up so I could have uh, area underneath it, but it was taking up basically all of this space. It'll still bloom beautifully. Uh, it's right at six feet tall, something like that. Uh, Miss Kim it's not the best lilac in the world by any stretch of the imagination, but it is one that will bloom here in zone 7B. We don't get, a lot, we don't get enough cold treatment for a lot of uh, lilacs, but this one, this one needs very little, very little winter cold uh, to flower. Uh, what I've underplanted it with uh, so far, uh, there is a Temple Bells uh, Pieris that's planted uh, right here. Temple Bells will reach, you know, I've seen them five feet, but I'm going to probably try to keep this one somewhere around three, three to four feet right in front of this fence. Uh, it gets little uh, white uh, flowers uh, that hang, that droop down uh, on it during the uh, winter time or late winter. And then the new growth on it is kind of a burgundy, uh, which looks great as well. We're in the in-between time now where it's just, you know, it's just green and that's what it will be most of the year. There are a few annuals planted into this space just to fill it in for right now. There's some terrenia here. The uh, hummingbirds love the terrenia uh, and other pollinators as well, but terrenia is a great uh, shade uh, annual. Uh, the first spot that we saw, I should have talked about this right from the beginning, the, uh, where we started over there is super, super sunny. I mean, it just absolutely cooks over there. By the time we get to here, my neighbor has a maple, a red maple above our head. It's actually not in the best of shape, but by the time we get to here, the shade starts to take over some. And so the Pieris is kind of a part shade shrub. The Terenia works great in light shade as, as an annual uh, flower. Uh, this is a Juga, which is a ground cover for the shade. Uh, Coleus will work in the shade. Um, I've got them in the sun out there as well, but um, um, great color uh, on the red Coleus. There's an Epimedium here. Uh, this Epimedium gets yellow flowers in the late winter, early spring. Uh, great perennial, um, really, really kind of underused, um, but it does uh, flowers for a, a good amount of time in the uh, late spring uh, and, uh, or late winter and early spring. This begonia I'm super excited about. Uh, this one's called Sterling Moon. Uh, I think it will be, it'll be released with, uh, in next year, I think. Um, there might be some availability on it now beautiful white and pink flowers on it incredible foliage it's supposed to be zone 7 hardy and so um you know i'm kind of trialing this plant to see uh whether it's zone 7 hardy as long as i have a normal uh winter here in zone 7b uh this uh this should come back but that variety is called sterling moon uh, it's just absolutely it's stunningly beautiful and tons and tons of flowers coming on it just planted it a few weeks ago, so it's just kind of settled in and just starting to uh, flower. Now, uh, repeating uh, coleus and terrenia on this end. And then this oak leaf hydrangea is called uh, a ruby slippers. You can see why it's called ruby slippers. It started out bright, bright white uh, and uh, has now turned to this uh, reddish uh, color, which will, it will hold for a little while. They'll, they'll fade uh, to uh, almost a papery uh, kind of texture and color uh, over the next uh, month or so. Uh, something's been chewing on it a little bit. I just don't worry about it. Um, people get paranoid over these kinds of things. I, don't, I just don't see the plants growing vigorously. It bloomed fine. It's got tons of new growth. I'm not going to worry about a leaf or two being chewed on it. I think that's, uh, you know, um, I'm not going to start spraying when the plant still seems vigorous. It still seems happy. Uh, who cares? So the last five or six plants here are definitely in the shade. This maple's above my head. Um, this lilac is uh, shading it as well. There's a hosta here called June. Uh, like any hosta, you know, I put this in as a little four inch pot a few weeks back and it needs to go to sleep one time before it becomes uh, anything of consequence. That's how, or, you know, that, that's how hosta work. They need one winter uh, in the ground and then it'll come up bigger, better, fuller next year. It is, it is throwing up a bloom. A uh, little bloom spike right now. Again, kind of insignificant right now. There's a hellebore or Lenten rose behind it. Uh, it's a, uh, was this fire and ice? 
no, Ice and Roses, uh, that's what it is. Uh, this one's from uh, Pine Knot, uh, from a cell they have when they have their open house. Beautiful pink, pink flowering variety. There's some Caladiums uh, planted behind it. I did a Dahlia Jump Start video earlier in the season, and the Caladiums were part of that Jump Start video where I just started all these in containers uh, early. So I think that by the end of the season, these will be a big giant cluster of them. Once they get going, they'll be super, super vigorous. Same thing with this elephant ear uh, that's here. Um, this thing, probably this season, could end up four or five uh, feet tall. There's another one on the other side you'll see in the uh, next video. And one of the plants I'm most excited about, excited about in this entire landscape, which looks like nothing uh, right now, is this aspidestra or cast iron plant. It's called a sahi and all of the tips on this one are bright white. So you're not seeing any of that now. I do have some new growth coming, so I'm excited to see when this new growth unfolds, whether it will start to show some of that color or not. But this cast iron plant over the next couple of years will end up, you know, two and a half to three feet tall, fill this entire space and have bright white on the top of it. It almost looks like candles. Uh, one of my absolute favorite favorite plants uh, right here and today it looks like almost uh, nothing so something to look forward to uh, in the future thank you guys for watching these uh, tour videos um, I'll be back in the next day or so with the uh, street area out here you can see why I'm breaking these down a little bit because there are a lot a lot of varieties uh, in this uh, landscape here in Raleigh North Carolina zone 7b uh, please subscribe to the channel hit that little bell notification so you're alerted when I upload videos and so you can follow along thanks for watching